Hello, I'm Gary Crowley and welcome to a special feature on your Slade in Flame DVD. Now we're now going to talk about the making of the movie and who better than to fill us in than the man himself, Noddy Holder. Nice to be here. Noddy, welcome. Let's go right back to the very beginning. Always a good place to uh, start, I find. How did all of this come about? Well, we, up until 1973, we'd really been on a crest of a wave for the first three years of the 70s with lots of hit records, lots of number one records. We'd had six number one records. And our manager, Chas Chandler, who was the bass player in The Animals, and he was also the man who discovered Jimi Hendrix and managed and produced Jimi Hendrix. He was our manager and producer. He always took the Beatles as the blueprint of our career. He always wanted us to emulate, or try to emulate, the sort of stages that the Beatles had gone through. So we'd had all the number one records. We'd gone straight into number one the first day of release with three records. And he saw it that the next career move for us would be a movie. Uh, we weren't actually sure about it. I mean, everybody wants to be in a movie, don't they? But, I mean, we weren't actually sure that we could pull it off. None of us had ever acted before. So it was a, a bit of a weird challenge for us. But he was determined. He was sure we could pull it off. Uh, but the next thing to do was to find a script or a story that he thought we could cope with. And we didn't want to end up doing... Well, me particularly, didn't want to end up doing a slapstick, run-around type movie, speeded up film and all that, because I thought that's what people would expect from us, automatically. That's what they'd put Slade in that bag. That's what they'd be, a comedy sort of fast-moving slapstick type film, which I thought was defeating the object a bit of making a movie, because that had been done before, with several groups had done it before. And Charles tended to agree if we could pull it off, actually acting, and find a real good story. And initially, we had a few people sent us scripts when the feelers were put out to get stories. And Chaz's assistant was a guy called John Steele, who was actually in The Animals with him. He was the drummer in The Animals. One of the ones he came up with was, uh, was a comedy, and it was a spoof on the Quatermass, Quatermass experiment. And it was going to be called the Quite a Mess Experiment. I was going to be Professor Quite a Mess. But Dave was going to be, Dave Hill was going to be killed in the first 15 minutes by the Triffids. So that had to go out the window because Dave wasn't going to be standing for that. So that one went to the wall. And we had a few other people sent us stuff, but nothing we really thought we could get our teeth into. I mean, we'd obviously got to do something that was based around music to pull it off. You know, we'd... That, that's the only thing, you know, we wanted, We really did want to include a lot of music in it, obviously. And um, eventually, Charles tracked down this script that had come through. He actually more or less commissioned it, really, that we'd make a film about the story of a rock and roll band. And so we, you know, we got various people to actually write treatments for us. And... The one treatment came in, which was the treatment which eventually became Flame. But when we read it, we liked the story, the basic idea of the story, but it wasn't true to life of what a band's all about. Unless you've been in a band, they tend to write about the myth of rock and roll, not, what, not the reality of rock and roll. And we wanted to show what it, rock and roll was really like, behind the scenes, not what the fantasy out front is, you know, that everybody sees all the glitz and glamour and the parties and all that. We wanted to show the other side of the business. And so what, what we did, the, the, the writer of, of, of Flame was a guy called Andrew Birkin, who was the brother of Jane Birkin, you know, who'd made that rather raunchy record in the 60s. <laughs> and uh, we thought we'd take him and Richard Longcrane, who was the director, it was, it was it actually, he was, was the director of the film, and it was the first movie he'd ever directed. He's, he's gone on to do lots of stuff since, but it was actually his first movie, it, directing. And we decided to take him on a tour of America, the two of them, to show them the reality of what life was like on the road. And whilst going travelling between gigs one-nighters, we would talk to them about our career, tell them stories about other bands' careers, and that would be assimilated into what flame the treatment that they'd sent us. So we took them 
to the States. I mean, they only lasted about two weeks on the road up. They couldn't take any more. I don't think they realised what a circus it all was. But they got enough material from us to go back and rewrite it and put it into the script. Every scene in the movie actually is true to life. Not Slade's, necessarily, but their stories from other bands. We didn't want it to be the story of Slade. We didn't want to confuse the fans or the public with making it a rockumentary of, of them thinking that it was Slade's story. It was loosely based on Slade's story, but with lots of other band stories thrown in. Good example um, is when I got nailed into the coffin early on in the film, that story came about by one of our old crew used to work for Screaming Lord Such. And one night, they Screaming Lord Such always used to enter in a locked coffin. They'd stand the coffin on stage at the start of the show. The music would play. An explosion would happen in the coffin. The lid would come open and there would appear Lord Such. But one night, they had a couple of new guys carrying the coffin in. And they put the coffin on the stage but the lid was facing the back of the stage against the wall and it was upside down so the music's playing the cue comes for the explosion for such to break out the coffin of course the lid's against the wall and he's trying to bash his way out of the coffin and can't get out the coffin in the opening of his show what's it doing in there? I'm trying to get out! Yeah. come out! I think I'm about to be best of and that's where that story came from that appeared in Slade. So all those little things that happened like that came from stories we knew from other people. So in fact, everything in it basically which was true. What do you remember about your first day on set? Any memories that spring to mind? Well, it was hard because we, we didn't really know whether we, were, whether we were any good. That was the difficulty. We'd learnt our lines as well as possible. But that, that's only a little snippet of acting. You've got to make it look natural. You've got to hit your marks. You've got to be in the right light at the right time and that. There's a dozen other things to think about, you know, besides um, the actual learning of your lines. You know, you can't just say that, hello, I am Noddy, or whatever. You know, it, it, it's... And so we, it, was, it, was, it was all brand new for us. But I think we fell into it very quickly. We sort of... Um, I wasn't in the, in the actual first days of shooting, I wasn't in actually the first days of shooting, but my first day on set was um, actually in the coffin scene, where I was actually in another band uh, uh, at the start of the film. So that was my actual first day of shooting. Um, and I, I suppose you get caught up with the atmosphere of it all. What we didn't realise, I think, was the amount of hanging around on a movie. We, we used to have to be up at six in the morning, on set for seven o'clock, you're in makeup, they're setting all the lights, the cameras, everything else, you do your first take, then they reset it, all the lights and cameras, do shot from the opposite direction, and then you're doing that all day. And probably a whole day's filming only produces a minute or two on screen which we didn't realise at that time. We thought, oh, we're going to sail through it, you know, we'll just hobble through, we'll do a take on the scene and that'll be it. We didn't realise the mechanics of it all and how many times you have to repeat the scene and do the same thing so it all edits together properly. The mechanics of the thing was what we, was, I think, was the shock factor for us. Can we talk about some of the um, scenes that I particularly enjoyed in the film? Um, one sees Flame visiting a pirate radio station on the Thames estuary with uh, DJ Tommy Vance, of course, playing uh, Ricky Storm. What memories do you have of that day? Well, that again, that, that again was a true story that happened in the 60s. There was a big pirate radio war going on in the, in the 60s at the end of pirate radio's days, and that actually happened where a pirate radio station did get fired at with machine guns and that it was a I don't know whether it was a war for getting revenue from advertising and stuff but it did actually happen and that was a that was actually a story that Chas knew because he knew the people that owned the radio station involved and he knew the story of it so that was something that Chas slipped in because he got it from his days with Hendrix he knew the background of that story so we fitted it in but I mean it was it was a very blustery day when we when we went out there and uh 
we have to actually climb those ladders up to the station. We all actually have to go up. I mean, Dave was terrified of heights. He had a nightmare getting up there, Dave did. I think we might have even, even used a standing in the end for Dave. I'm not sure, I can't remember. But he was terrified of heights and he was terrified of climbing up. But the rest of us actually climbed that ladder up there. And the wind and the sea was spraying all over us and everything. I mean, it was it was pretty hairy getting up there. I mean, the helicopter took us off, as, as happened in the film. But getting on was a different story. There's also a lovely scene where um, Dave Hill and Don Powell walk into a showroom and buy a roller. Would that have happened in real life? Quite possibly. Knowing Dave Hill, it could quite possibly have happened that, absolutely. That was maybe one of his stories that he told, uh, Andrew Birkin. Uh, but he, he, he did have a roller, and Don, had, Don also had a Bentley, and Jim had a roller. I think I was the only one who didn't actually have a roller. So it could have well have happened with Dave that he, he certainly would have swanned into a, a car showroom and sat in the car and tried everything out, and that he, that would have been his character, absolutely. Of course, Alan Lake plays the irrepressible Jack Daniels in the movie. What memories do you have of him? Well, Alan, Alan kept the, the whole film on a light-hearted footing really when we're sitting around waiting for sets to be rebuilt and lighting to be redone and everything Alan was the one who told us stories and he kept us amused the whole time because you couldn't the, the problem was with Alan shutting him up not getting him to talk was to actually shutting him up and uh, he'd actually just come out of prison not long he'd been in prison for uh, had a little kerfuffle in a pub with somebody who'd insulted Diana Dawes and he'd been put in prison for a while and so he was telling us all the stories about what it was like in jail and telling us about the other prisoners and that. And he, he was a very entertaining guy, absolutely entertaining guy. But his main problem was he was a big drinker. And on my first day of shooting, we were actually filming in, in a little club, as I say, for the, the coffin scenes and that. But the group that became Flame, Jack Daniels' band, was also in the same scenes. So at lunchtime, he disappeared off to the pub. Alan comes back in the afternoon the worst for wear he'd had a bit too much to drink he'd had a, a liquid lunch shall we say and he actually set about the manager of this club we were filming he picked an argument with the, with the real manager of the club not the manager in the film the man the guy who managed the club for real he had a bit of an argument and I think he, I think he gave him a smack to one I think he smacked him one and because of his drinking and we were only very, we'd only been a couple of days into the film by then. He got fired. They fired him the first day because of his drinking and smacking this guy. We were really, because we really wanted Alan in the movie. We were, we were really uptight about it and we were sort of complaining to the producers and that and saying, you know, we've really got to get round this somehow because we really want him in it. And because uh, he was a character and he was Jack Daniels. I mean, he was perfect. He, and he, he played the part absolutely perfectly and actually Diana Dawes came to us and pleaded with us to take him back and said she'd ensure that he didn't have another drink during filming on the day you know on, on the set or anything and he stuck to it and we took him back and he did he stuck to it he, he was dry the rest of the, the rest of the film Tom Conti of course plays Seymour um, one of the band's managers um, what memories do you have of working with him it was, it was Tom Conti's first film also he hadn't made a movie before that Tom Conti he was unknown um, he, I mean he was perfect he was perfect casting because he was I mean he wasn't the actor Tom you know he, he was I think uh, he probably thought at the time what on earth am I doing in a movie with these scallywags who haven't acted before? You know, he was a trained actor. And, uh, but he was a smashing guy. And he, and he was perfect for the character of Seymour. Because Seymour had got to be aloof. He'd got to be this aloof character. Hello. Last we meet. This is Robert Seymour. I take it Tony's explained what we have in mind. I assume you have no objections. Why else? Pardon? Why else? Uh, this is Russell Hayes, Robert. Uh, he drives the van and shifts around the equipment. They did request for him to be included. He's the roadie. Is he? 
There's some great lines in there. Johnny Shan Shannon's got a fantastic yeah, line. Yeah. Of course, he plays um, the band's original manager, Mr. Harding. Harding yes. Yeah. Well, again, any, any kind Who of. Who I ha actually hated with a vengeance. Me and Harding had this hate relationship from the off, which I always had that relationship with wise guy managers, really, in real life. And so Harding was an amalgamation of a lot of wise guys managers that were around in the early days of all bands just trying to make that quick book he was an amalgamation of that hardy but the heavier side of that because there was lots of managers around like hardy in those days probably still are today but in those days it, it was quite the norm for for, for managers uh, of bands to be like that and to rip them off all the time and uh, johnny shannon was uh, Johnny Shannon was fantastic because he's such a. You've only got to look at him, and, he, and he's he, he is such a. I don't know what the word would be. Menacing. Menacing. That's the word. Yeah. Such a menacing face. Anyway, and his whole acting ability. He did everything very slowly, and and it, the whole thing was menacing. He'd act like a nice man, but uh, there was an, always an underlying thing there. And we actually, the reason we had Johnny Shannon in, was he was in performance. That is why we'd chosen him, because we'd seen him in performance. We had to make it violent. My, my, my scenes with him, especially the scene where he comes in, and, and we've done the first, first gig, and, and he's, he's, sort of, you know, he, he's sort of saying, you're a second-rate group and all that business. And he actually grabs my hair. And he did really grab my hair. He pulled my hair down. And we had to keep doing retakes of the shot from different angles. And he pulled it every time. He didn't hold any punches, Johnny. You're just second-rate comics working on a third-rate audience. With a fourth-rate agent copping 10%. Oh, then, Yeah, you handle it, Ron. And I said, you can't keep pulling me out like this. It's really hurting. He said, that's why it'll look good. And in fact, how do you feel that you and in fact the whole band acquitted yourselves in front of the camera now looking back? Well, of course, I thought I was fantastic in it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm really sad I didn't get an Oscar. I, I really expected to be nominated and when I didn't get that nomination for the Oscar, I thought, well, oh, that's it, you know, that passed me by. Uh, but I, I thought I did all right. I thought we all did all right, quite frankly. I, th I, th I, think, we, I think some of us liked it better than others. I think, but I think we all carried our, our bits that we all had to do. Because I think the writer and the director had sussed who could do what and gave them the amount of stuff in the movie that they thought we could handle and get away with. And I think, and I think that was good on their part. You know, and um, as I said earlier, I thought, I thought Jim, Jim took it very seriously which is his way anyway, that's the sort of character he is. But we had great scenes together, me and Jim, and I think we pulled off the serious stuff together, which is odd when you've never acted before. I mean, there's, a, there's that scene when we're going up in the lift towards the end of, uh, at the end of the movie. I mean, it's, it's a very, very uh, tear-jerking scene. And I think, I think we pulled it off. Because you, you can imagine two blokes starting off in a band years before and you've been through all the the rubbish of you know changing in toilets and all that together and then you reach these ac accolades of success and it's not what you expect it to be you, it's not this he heavenly sort of wonderful place to live in and I, and I think that scene in the lift sort of summed that up that it was all caving in around us our whole world was caving in around us what are we going to do then? Are we going on the group? What group? Look, I'm sorry about all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I know. You know I didn't mean it. But I did. And those sort of scenes, I think, were the icing on the cake, from me and Jim's point of view, from an act acting point of view. And, uh, I don't know. I think everybody will like something of, of each character's in it. I think there's something for everybody in there. If you're a fan of Dave, you'd have liked Dave's character. If you're a fan of Jim, you'd like Jim's character. I think we pulled it off. Um, we no, I never for a minute expected to, but I think we did. And, and even seeing it again now, it stood up. It stood the test of time, which I'm surprised it does, but I, you know, I'm, I'm pleased it has because 
way back then I just hoped it would because we hadn't made a film that was we'd, we'd not made a movie that was easy to do we could have took the easy option we could have definitely took the easy option probably in success terms of box office would have probably been a much bigger hit than it was it was successful but if it had been what people wanted from Slade it could have probably been a much bigger success box office wise funnily enough when it, it went to America and it opened in America and we had the opening the previews and that in St. Louis which was r right in the middle of America the Midwest <clears throat> and it was one of our big areas in the States we were very very big in the Midwest area so we decided to open the movie there nobody could understand a word of it they actually subtitled it in America <laughs> they put subtitles along the bottom they couldn't understand the black country accents of ours at all because <laughs> when we used to go to the States people used to think we were Australian <laughs> so they ended up subtitling it which was <laughs> I mean it was the funniest thing you'd ever seen in your life we were that sort of characters in the band we were the chalk and cheese characters we were the, the, the writers in the band so we couldn't have been more different in real life and in the film so it, it was just emphasising our relationship in real life really I think the, 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 the way we were in the movie emphasised what, what, what real life was like for us so I would probably be the sort of one who would say pick on Jim if he was moaning about something and saying well you want to be in the band it's you who wanted to do this and you want that you can't get, have it and then start moaning about it and I'd, I would do that probably in real life in the band also and I think Jim took his part in the film I think he probably he was the one he, it affected most the actual his character in the film he was very serious about the part and doing it right he he had that sort of attitude to it. but he, he, did, he did that about music he did that about everything he goes into and, and I think it affected him the actual trauma of the story of, of the film actually got to Jim probably more than the other three of us with Don he was the buffoon in the band he was the mad drummer like every band has and the mad drummer Don was that person in the film he was like that also but the thing about Don was he just a year before had a bad car accident he'd nearly been killed in a bad car accident so he'd come out of this car accident with very 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 bad memory he couldn't taste or smell and his short-term memory was day to day he does things one day and forget about them the next he'd forget about them half an hour later so for him it was a double trauma he'd got to learn his lines he'd got to know where he'd got to move and everything but from one take he'd have forgotten it by the time he come to the second take because his short-term memory had still not improved that much it was only about a year after we started filming that he'd had the accident so for Don it was very very hard work and Don pulled it off I mean there's a great scene with Don which was probably his main solo scene in the movie when he's in the canal with his old boss it's a great scene in the film it's Don's best to me it's Don's best scene in the film but for him to learn those lines and to hold that conversation with, that, with the guy was very difficult for him because his memory was haywire at that time really haywire and so he really pulled off a coup Don did because it, most of the other stuff in the film he was the jolly jovial one pulling the crockery off on the train and all you know they were mainly one liners he'd got which we had to give him them you know so they were easy for him to remember um, but that one scene by the canal was a real difficult for him and, he, and it's, it's, it's one of the probably one of the most heart rendering scenes in the film like a bleeding bunch of Peter Pans, just like that. Getting close, you'll see this thing's moving. Hey, you're doing all right, aren't you? It's what you wanted to do. I don't know. It's not the same anymore. Make a few records, that bit's okay. The rest of the time, it's a bunch of bleeding ganks in the dinner jackets. What do you do, though? The whole scenes wouldn't like it. Well, if you don't want to get out, there's only one thing you can do. Let them get on with it. Let them all take themselves to pieces if they feel like it. You won't change anything by doing it to yourself. Nobody ever does. So what happens to me in the meantime? You'll survive, Charlie. You aren't doing badly now, as far as I can make out. Dave's this sort of... Um, probably the same sort of character to me. He, his confidence was such that he would... Uh, 
he'd just go along with the flow, Dave. You know, he, he the, the the stuff the, the stuff that was written for him was stuff that he could handle and would suit him. Yeah, that that's that, that's all I can sum up with Dave. But I think Dave was probably the one at the end of it all, and probably while we were making the movie, but certainly when he saw the movie and he and he got the public reaction to the movie, was he didn't think it was right for the band to make a dark, serious movie. He would have been Dave much happier if he could have been skipping around and dancing around and done a slapsticky type of film. I think Dave's attitude was much more to go that way. I don't think he felt it was right for the band, uh, especially after seeing it and um, getting the fans' reaction to it. You see, I thought exactly the opposite. I thought we got to go that way, otherwise it would just have been another string to Slade's bow, if you like, that it would have been totally what would have been expected to us. There would have been no shock factor there at all. Plus the fact of us proving we could do a bit of acting. I mean, nobody's ever going to say we were great actors in that film. But we pulled it off. More by luck than judgment, probably. But we did. We pulled it off. And it worked. And surprisingly enough, the critics, who we thought would absolutely slaughter us for attempting it, didn't. They actually, the critics were great to it. Barry Norman, I, re I remember, gave it a fabulous review and said we'd really sort of redeemed ourselves I in his mind of what he thought it was going to be. I think everybody, from the critics' point of view, everybody thought it was going to be rubbish. But it wasn't rubbish, and I think that was a plus in our favour, because I thought, oh, blimey, this is good, we'd better get into this and watch it. Because it wasn't an instant, it wasn't sort of an instant jolly jolly thing which I think the fans were expecting um, I think the fans attitude were, was at the time I'm not saying everybody but I think the fans attitude was that it was certainly not what they wanted from us it had killed the myth and that's what Dave was worried about also it had killed the myth of, of what Slade were all about we were our image at the time was this jolly jolly band, four mates who went on and we entertained and we had a laugh and that was it. And that's what the fans wanted to see in the film. They didn't want to see this dark side of the rock and roll business. I don't think the group Flame was what Slade were. But the others in the band did. And so did the audience. I didn't. I thought, I actually thought that the film stood, it, stood up on its own. And plus setting it, plus I, th I thought it helped as well, setting it in the 60s, the late 60s, rather than setting it in the 70s where everybody would have automatically again thought it was the story of Slade, we actually set it in the late 60s. So it, it, it gave it a bit of a different, a different tack on things as well. I remember when we, when, we, when we had the premiere in London, all the business people were sitting upstairs in, in the, you know, in the gallery up, up top and all the fans were sitting below in the stalls and various lines in the film or various things that happened in the film the business people in the rock and roll business in the music business they were reacting and laughing or going ooh at certain bits because they knew the character in real life who, the, who we were talking about and the fans below were laughing and reacting to different things so it was all, it was totally different reaction from the business to the, you know, the pub, the general public. We knew all the people who, who it was depicted in there, and so did most of the music business. But the fans hadn't got a clue. Well, let's talk about the songs, if we can. How would you have approached the recording and also the writing of the songs for the film? We'd already started writing songs for the next album. Um, so then we had to adapt them songs to be included in the movie as I, you know we had the movie had to feature a lot of songs and they'd all have got to be new songs there was no way we were going to play come on feel the noise or whatever we we wanted a new batch of songs and they'd got to be songs that had the feeling of the of the movie probably some of them a bit more um a bit more 60s bass because of uh, the time setting of it and re really we, we, I think what we did initially is we set about 
making an album as an album as it would stand up on its own probably not a typical Slade album but looking at it that it was going to be a piece of work as an album not just a film soundtrack so that's how we did set about it we decided also that it wouldn't just be Slade songs with a Slade sound we wanted to augment the band so we brought in a brass section all top notch session players who were fantastic a lot of them actually went on to form the band Gonzales in the late 70s, a uh, soul, sort of soul band. Haven't Stopped Dancing. Haven't Stopped yeah. Dancing, yet, correct. And uh, great musicians, big help to us in the studio, you know, because we'd never really worked with other musicians before. And um, the probably the two main songs we had to concentrate on was Far, Far Away, which ca became the biggest hit from the film, which still today is probably one of my favourite Slade songs, if not my favourite Slade song. Why? Um, well, the reason it's my favourite Slade song was, was it's to do with Slade probably more than it's to do with the movie because the time it was written was sitting on the banks of the Mississippi River. We'd been out on tour for virtually two years non-stop. We hadn't really been home. We were sitting on the banks of the Mississippi River after a gig in Memphis one night sitting on the balcony of the hotel, had a few drinks, got a bit a bit out of it, and uh, this paddle boat steamer come down the Mississippi River, and we thought, we've been away from home this long, it's, who'd have ever thought this yobbo from Wolverhampton would be sitting by the sides of the Mississippi watching a paddle steamer come by, having a bloody margarita or something, and there was that side of it which was fantastic but we'd been away for so long that we were just the light was at the end of the tunnel for the end of the tour to go out which we hadn't been home for so long and the first line of far far away is i've seen the yellow lights go down the mississippi and once i got that line i went off and actually i said it to Chaz. i said oh that'd be a great i'll help you to a song and he said go and do it now so I went to the bedroom and I actually wrote all the verses out you know I'd done them in like an hour or two I'd, I'd got in the bedroom and written them all out just from the thinking of that song so probably that sticks in my mind because of the slide part of it not because of what it was in the movie but it fitted great in the movie as well but probably the song that has really got in people's consciousness now many years later is the theme tune for the, f the film which was how does it feel now how does it feel at the time came out as the second single from the album from the film and it was our smallest hit for a long time it didn't even make the top 10 and because it was most unlike Slade that you could possibly imagine it was not a rocky raucous thing I sang it in a very gentle voice uh, it was very piano based it was nothing at all like Slade we had all the brass section on it and it was, wasn't, wasn't really what fans were ex expecting as the next single but it was a great record we always had massive conf confidence in it as a great record but it wasn't a big, a big hit it was, a, it was a got top 20, about 15 or something but it wasn't a massive hit in our terms top 3 like all our records had been <coughs> and Actually, Jim, it, it basically, it, it, it was Jim's, all the piano thing, and that was all Jim's thing. He'd, he'd had this piano riff for years, he'd been playing it for years on the piano, it was his little party piece that he, he'd catted around with for years, and he actually always wanted to use it on something. Of course, when the film came along, it was perfect for the film opening credits, and to use as the incidental music through the film, because there's lots of little factions in the song up tempo bits loud bits quiet bits so we could take any bits out of it and use as incidental music during the run of the film anyway so it did actually become by default more than anything the theme tune for the movie at the time people didn't write it we rated it ourselves certainly me and jim rated it uh it, and it, we went in to record it on on the day and it was just one of those days where you get the feel me and jim had done it at home with him playing the piano and me singing it i'd done all the lyrics for it and that and just the feel of it at home we knew we'd written a nice song um 
not a tip, not a Slade song, not a typical Slade song. We didn't even know at the time that Slade would even end up doing it till the movie came along. But it was a, we knew we'd done a great song, and we went in and we put it down in the studio like that, exactly as we'd done it at home with my voice and Jim playing the piano. And that's how I got the feel on the vocal for it. It was a very, very melancholy vocal, and I was really chuffed with the vocal performance on it. And um, then we overdubbed everything else came on it, all the loud bits and everything. We, they were all overdubbed eventually bit by bit. And um, at the time, it wasn't rated. But now, you ask people now, and lots of people now, come up to us and say, it's one of the best things you ever did, if not the best. I mean, people like Noel Gallagher say it's his favourite Slade song. And I'm mates of mine, they say, but at the time, nobody nobody rated it in, the, in, in that time period. Because it was totally unexpected for a band like us to do that. And it works perfectly in the film. I mean, the opening credits, when that tinkling piano comes in over the, you know, it all starts to sort of t take, take shape at the start of the film. It just it just fitted in like jigsaw really, and I mean so effective. Um, I, I, I suppose those things come along once in a blue moon, you, and when they happen and they work dead right, uh, and we would put a lot of work into that record. We put a lot of work into the album. Full stop. I mean there was obviously the rockier stuff on there, like standing on the corner, and then them, them kind of monkeys can't swing, which were out and out rock rock things, you know, which we'd got to put in the film too give it some, you know, some of that nitty gritty, you know, of what a, a dirty little smelly rock and roll band playing around the clubs were like, you know, you'd got to put those songs in there as well. So in fact on the album there, there was all sorts of mixture of music on, on that album. Probably the most diverse album we'd done to that, up to that point. And we did, in the end, have to end up structuring it for the movie, even though it wasn't originally, it was just going to be the next Slade album. But obviously when the movie came along, we chopped and changed it around so lyrically as much as anything else I, I changed lyrics on songs so they would depict various proportions and, uh, and what was going on in the film as well. The film's pretty scathing though about the music business isn't it? I mean what are your thoughts on that? Well I, I think I think if, you, if you'd got to do a story like that you've got to you'd got to show the downside of the business and, uh, and even though the fans or the public wouldn't want to accept it that that's what went on. It did go on, so you it would it would have been silly to make a movie with that sort of storyline. Really, it, it 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 could mean as much today as it did way back then. You get four guys who form a band, or four girls who form a band. It doesn't matter who. You form a band. In that in the case of Flame, which is probably more relevant today than it was then. You get a big time manager or who wasn't really into rock music at all comes along. He was into commodities, selling a commodity. He says there's even, even a line in the films, film that says he could have been a tin of bag beans for all he's concerned. All he got to know is how to market it and sell it, which is probably more valid today in today's marketplace of pop music than it was then. So in a way, it was before its time what we were saying in that film, but pop music has always been a commodity it, in the eyes of someone like that. The artistic side didn't matter to, to Seymour. The, the actual music, the performance, didn't matter to him. All he saw was this commodity that he could market and sell, and sell to the general public. Now, you have got to show in the film that if you are doing a story of a band, you have got to show that side of it. The public might not like it, but they are being sold a product. And the fact of all the, what goes on behind the scenes, the artistic side of it, in many cases, has to take a back seat. You know, you have to meet the deadline. Your album needs release, and you've got to meet the deadline. You can't go on forever unless you've unless you've got a, a never-ending contract whereby the record company will allow you to record for five years to do an album. In those days, in the 70s, we bought an album out a year. You didn't have the luxury of two years making an album, three years making an album. You had to bring an album out every year to stay in the public, in the limelight. Three singles a year, 
that's a hell of a lot of product to get to. While you're touring the world as well at the same time, doing all your promotions on TVs and radios and all the rest of it. There wasn't such thing as videos and MTVs and stuff like that in those days. You had to go out on the road and slog it. You had to go to each country to perform on TV. That was the way of the world. So you, you have to balance this up with your artistic side of writing the songs, rehearsing the songs, going to the recording studio, making the songs, producing the songs with the marketing strategy of going out and selling the songs and we have to show that in the movie as well that it is not all glamorous it, it, it's a lot of hard work and when the pressure's on for any band when they're successful they become successful as Flame did as Slade did Flame became this big successful band but the pressure's on them because the marketing people and whatever they want the next product as soon as they've sold the one product, they want the next product. And the pressure's on you all the time. Now, you haven't got the luxury when you start out and you haven't got a record deal. You've written lots of songs. You've got a batch of songs. So when you go in and do your first album, you've got a ton of stuff there ready. You have to write the next album while you're in the process of promoting the album before. You've got to be already starting writing the next one. So the pressure is never off you. And, of course, that leads to bickering in bands. It leads to uh, jealousies. It leads to egos going astray. And it happens in every band. There's not one band can say that that is not happened to them. Um, and we have to show that. In Flame, we have to show it. Because it happened in, to, to the band Flame. It happened just the same as it happens to every single band. And it's no good whitewashing it. We wanted to put it all in. I wouldn't say that was the whole band's point of view. But if you're going to do a movie like that, you have got, you know, you've got to... You've got to show that downside of it. The public might not like it because they want to see the glamour and the fantasy and the good time and, and all that, which is all very well. So they should. It's not their problem what goes on behind the scenes. They've paid their money. They want to see the show or they want to hear the record. They shouldn't be concerned with what goes on behind the scenes and the problems. But it does happen. And if you're going to make a movie, you make a movie about that subject, you've got to include all the crap. You can't just say it's all sweetness and light because it's not it's not all sweetness and light in, in pro on, a, on, on a percentage scale the sweetness and light probably covers about 30% of it the rest of it is hard work and a lot of hassle did you then Noddy and also now find acting as rewarding as playing music I did actually because it's still a creative process I mean I wouldn't say by any stretch of the imagination that I'm, I'm a great actor I'm a far better singer or musician than I, than I am an actor um, as, as is proved by when I finished Flame it was 20 years before I got another acting part so I was resting for quite a long time <laughs> but uh, I, did, I, I did find it very rewarding and I you see how I've always looked on myself even from when I was a little kid I didn't all, always look on myself as I was going to be in a rock and roll band and, and be in a pop group and be a rock and roll star. That that was never sort of in my thoughts when I was a little kid. But I, I was when I was seven years old, I was on the stage singing in working men's clubs way back in 1953. I was first on stage. So I always thought I'd be an entertainer, in inverted commas. Not necessarily just a singer, but an entertainer in one way or another. Whether I'd ever make it professionally, I never knew at that age but I always knew that's what I wanted to do when I discovered rock and roll when Elvis came along in the mid 50s and then when the first time I saw Little Richard that was it then I wanted to be a rock and roller because that I knew that was me rock and roll was me I was always into music from when I was a tiny kid but when rock and roll appeared that was me I grew up in my eyes for the best time for the best era I was born in 1946 I grew up in the 50s, I was there I was there at the birth of rock and roll with Bill Ailey and the Comets and Elvis and then all the Little Richards and all these people. I was, a, I was there a teenager when the Beatles appeared. I was there at the birth of groups that wrote their own songs. So I've grown up in my mind with the history of rock and roll and that's what I always wanted to be. Once I discovered it, that's it, it was full stop. But it wasn't just being a singer and being in a group that I wanted. I wanted to be an entertainer. I wanted to be all things to all men. I always had. So the thought of being, when Chas suggested being, we're going to make a film, 
I was like, yippee, you've got to be on a film. You know, whether I could do it or not, didn't care. Whether I could act, didn't care. Just, I wanted to be in a film. You know, because you know, obviously Marlon Brando in the 50s, you see, whatever. You want to be there on the big screen. It's the next step. And uh, that was it for me. That That's the whole thing about it. The same as after I left the band. I've done loads of other things. I've done acting, I've done radio shows, I've been TV presenter, radio presenter. But to me, it's all entertaining. It all comes under the inverted commas of entertainer, which is always what I've set out to do. Never never for a minute thought I'd just spend my whole life in a rock band, which is what I spent the bulk of my professional life doing. I mean, I, I was in a rock band for, with Slade for 25 years. I was with other bands for five years before that. So I was actually in a rock and roll band for 30 years near enough which is a long time a big slice of your life but I always knew there was all the strings to me bow that I wanted so from an acting point of view when I did the TV stuff with the Grimleys and stuff I loved the process of doing it of actually learning the lines learning the tricks of the train actually going to work on the day and seeing the finished product on screen I actually liked the process of doing it and then seeing it how it all comes out obviously you pick faults for your performance like you do when you make a record or an album you pick the faults out because you know the faults because you, you were there doing it same when you're acting you know the faults so you are actually looking for stuff far deeper than I mean I hate watching documentaries on how movies are made because to me it spoils the myth I don't want to see how they're made I just want to see the finished product and I don't want to see how, how this is done and how that's done I want to see the finished thing and that's how I look on everything. I, all I'm interested in is how it appears, the finished product appears. Uh, I enjoy the process of doing it, like writing songs or anything, but I don't take it to heart. It's not something that stresses me out. I don't get stressed by making a, making a film or, or making a TV series or anything. I don't get stressed by it because the only thing I care about is how it appears at the end of the day, not the process it's taken to get there. And I think with the, with the rest of them in the band, with Flame, they were more worried about the making of it than how it appeared at the end. And, and, and nobody's interested in that. They only want to see what they see as the end product. It, in the making of it is... Nobody's really particularly interested in the, in the logistics of it. They, they're only interested in the final product. Of course, this was your first acting role. Was there ever any talk of perhaps there being a follow-up to Flame? Well, there was. There was talk of making a, a follow-up movie, but not, not, not as a follow-up to Flame. But we, we did get offered... What, what happened with Flame, you see, it was a long process, which we didn't realise how long a process it would be. We had to write the album. We had to record the album. We had to, you know, have, have script meetings and all that and, and take the people on the road, as I said, for, for getting a script together, a storyline together. We had to, the actual process of shooting the film, which was actually very short in film terms. We actually shot it in, I think it was about eight weeks. We shot it, and it was all on location. There was no studio stuff in the film. Every, every, every part of it was done on location. Um, then we had to s set aside time for promotion. So from the actual start of having the idea for the film, well, actually start not having the idea, but to actually start the work on the film, to the finish of the promotion of the film, when it was released in the cinemas, and then going around and doing all the promotion in all those cinemas, because we, we, we had a premiere in London, we had a premiere in other cities in the, in the country as well, and we actually in each city we went on a fire engine because it was called flame somebody had this mad idea that we appear at the premiers on a massive fire engine so we were coming through the streets of london on this bloody fire engine with the bells ringing and everything somebody's uh, <laughs> pr uh, sort of genius <laughs> at work there but there, there again it's, it's, a, it's another thing like happened in the film where the pr guy gets the microphone where the you know and uh, they come up with these ideas that you expect me to sing into this, but they come up with it. They don't think you have actually got to sing it and it could burn your bloody head off. They don't care about that. It's just a good photo opportunity. The same as the fire engine was at the premieres. You know, it's a good photo opportunity. Flame, fire engine, yes, we'll do it. And there's us, like lemons in the freezing cold, you know, going through London with wind blowing and uh, everything, getting off, getting off at the uh, cinema to have our pictures took with all our air out here because the wind's blown us to kingdom come. <laughs> so, um, but the whole process of making the movie took a long time. Probably over a year, probably near 18 months. So to go into a follow-up movie straight away, we could not risk taking another 18 months of our pop career 
and starting another one. But we were offered a film actually starring uh, the two Ronnies, Ronnie Corbett and Ronnie Barker. And they wanted to do, it, it was going to be a comedy, uh, a spoof spy thing where some Russian tapes or something, secrets, were smuggled in our equipment. <laughs> Good plot. Um, but we never got made, and uh, well, I don't think we could have ever possibly done it anyway. It would have just took too long out of our uh, out of our pop career to do another one right on the back of it. But but they, the company that was going to make it were very interested in doing it, you know, because they thought we we obviously got away with the acting side of it, and they thought it would be good. But the two Ronnies were going to be these sort of James Bond type characters. It was going to be a spoof Russian spy thing, which might have been good after Flame. Actually, a good comedy spoof might have actually been good, but. Um, it never came up. It's great today to have a f that you've appeared a film under your belt, and it's there for uh, forever now. Well, say I've been in a film, and you can actually watch it still. And um, yeah, I, I looked on it as a great experience. I don't know whether the I don't know whether that would be the feeling of the whole of the band. I don't know uh, because I th I think they thought it, it detracted. The actual finished product detracted from our pop career and our popularity with the public seeing not what they wanted to see from Spade. So I, th I think the general feeling in the band was that uh, at the end of the day. But I I'm really pleased with it, and it, and it, and it, it is a great thing to to have that, that we did we did a movie and we did a a credible movie to boot and a movie that that has stood the test of time.